mimicked her life, her being this incredible superstar, uh, and people seeing kind of what it might, might be a little bit like for her. Thematically, it's really written deep and ingrained in our collective psyche as a generation. And to cap it all, in 1992, she finally got married to Bobby Brown, but some people felt they were badly matched. He wouldn't belong with somebody like her. She's, she's high society, and he's so not. The public, they're going, ew, these two don't match. That's not cute. Whitney's marriage to Bobby further diminished the protective influence of her mum, Sissy, and also threatened her close relationship with good friend Robin Crawford. And, you know, there were major fights with Bobby and Robin going on in public hotels in Hollywood for struggle over who was going to keep Whitney, really. Was, was she going to the angels or going to the devil? You know, basically, and she chose the devil. Robin remained on the management team, but was kept at a distance. Meanwhile, Whitney and Bobby were busy playing the ultimate celebrity couple, even gleefully declaring their love and solidarity in pop videos. But behind the glossy, aspirational PR lay a shocking truth. They actually had something more in common than their fans suspected. Bobby was also a drug taker, and Uncle Rob had a new customer. When Whitney was in town, you know, her and Bobby, uh, you know, they would call me practically every day that they was in town. A few times, three times a day, I got calls, you know, to make trips to her home. That's probably what brought them together with such a strong bond. Once you get to that next level of drug consumption, the choosing of your partner is very important. Whitney chose somebody who shared a secret. The enormous gulf between wholesome public persona and secret private life was vividly illustrated by Whitney's casting in this unwittingly ironic public health campaign. It's no secret that America has a drug problem. The secret seems to be that we also have some drug solutions. In a time when an astonishing 15 to 20 percent of our children will become serious substance abusers, we need solutions more than ever. Bobby is often blamed for Whitney's drug troubles. Some observers think differently. She, she was a veteran of, of, of the drug culture, you know, when Bobby came along. See, people got to realize that Whitney was old, much older than Bobby, probably about four or five years. So she got that much experience over him. She enabled him to be where he is. Now, he didn't have all the money to buy the drugs and stuff like that. She didn't. You know, so it's not all on him. She was addicted before she even met him. By the mid-90s, Whitney seemed on the surface to be holding it together. Bobby, however, was definitely on the slide. With his career in terminal decline, he was quickly becoming Mr. Whitney Houston and something of an embarrassment. Prosecutors say he was driving a Porsche more than twice over the legal Mr. limit. Bobby Brown may have committed misdemeanor sexual Senior battery. Bobby Brown insists he would not hurt him. After paying more than $63,000 in back child support. Just another chapter that's earned Brown the nickname Bad Boy Bobby. This isn't fair. This ain't fair, man. Bobby's bad boy image was becoming all too real, with an ever-expanding rap sheet that included several court appearances and even two spells in jail. He was seemingly out of control. He had urinated on the backseat of the deputy's patrol car, um, urinated all over the cage, urinated uh, on the seat itself, urinated underneath the passenger floorboard. But despite Bobby's many scrapes with the law and reports of multiple infidelities, Whitney remained beyond steadfast in her support for him. Whitney Houston giving husband Bobby Brown a kiss of support for the first time. And then he went to jail for 65 days for a DUI um, where he was uh, driving intoxicated. And who can forget this very famous picture where he comes out of jail. She jumps out of her limo. She runs into her arms, throws her arms and legs around him. Uh, so excited to have him home. Most of us, if their husband had been in jail for 65 days for driving while intoxicated, would of course be happy to see them, but wouldn't treat it like it was a party. Excuse, me. Excuse us. Bye. Whitney, anything you'd like to say to the people at home? Uh -uh, nothing. Happy to have your husband back, ma'am? Uh -uh. Have a good night. I think what Whitney has um, with Bobby and what goes on in a lot of relationships where both 
parts of the couple are addicts is that there's a codependency going on. It's a poor way to be. It's, it's never going to be a healthy relationship when they're codependents. Morning, Ms. Houston. How are you? Mrs. Brown. Mrs. Brown. I make out good today. You got footage, baby. For the most part, it had been Bobby's behavior attracting the attention of the media. But by the year 2000, it was Whitney's life that was starting to unravel. In the space of two years, her good friend Robin quit as her personal assistant. Then, more ominously, her mentor, Clive Davis, parted company with Arista and Whitney. Definitely, when they parted, you know, her public persona started falling apart. I mean, I think he's probably one of the few people who was able to step in and say, hey, Whitney, by the way, get the hell over here to this appearance. And she'd be like, no, no, no. And he would make her. And I think he had the capacity to do that in a way that nobody else did. Whitney's own behavior was now becoming more erratic and the previously impeccable facade slipping publicly. She was thrown off the Oscars for behaving eccentrically, was caught smuggling marijuana into Hawaii and was canceling appearances at the last minute. Whitney at one point was probably the most unreliable person on the face of the earth. She was not able to show up and function at anything. Her concerts, interviews, when she did, the performances and even her appearance had also started to suffer. At Michael Jackson's 30th anniversary bash, a sudden, all too evident extreme weight loss shocked many who knew her. That um, uh, Michael Jackson special, I, that was like, I was absolutely devastated. I could not believe what I saw. It's like, okay, to anybody, it's clear that she has a problem. A week after this performance, it was widely announced that Whitney had died from a drug overdose which she was actually forced to come out and deny. But things had clearly come to a head. In 2002, an interview with chat show hostess Diane Sawyer became a watershed moment in Whitney's life. After years of denial, she finally came clean on her drug use in a landmark, genuinely astonishing TV confession. Is it alcohol? Is it marijuana? Is it cocaine? Is it pills? It has been. At times. All? At times. If you had to name the devil for you, the biggest devil among them? That would be me. Why did someone not stop that interview? She left us all with, a, with an image of somebody that desperately needed help. As it carried on, things got notably bleaker with Whitney's infamous and disturbingly illogical denial that she used crack. Let's get one thing straight. Crack is cheap. I make too much money to ever smoke crack. Let's get that straight, okay? We don't do crack. We don't do that. Your crack is whack. This was just so typical of an event that would have never happened if Clive Davis had been in the picture. He would have never let her go in front of TV cameras looking like that, acting like that. There would have been what they called damage control. Instead, what we got was 100% damage. But with no one to put the brakes on her, things got even worse. Just two weeks later, an angry Whitney called Wendy Williams, a notorious New York shock jock, renowned for regularly sniping at the troubled singer. Wendy, Wendy, Wendy. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my Lord, have I waited for this day. What she was, for instance, when I interviewed her, was a mess. In my opinion, she was high out of her mind. And she talked like she was high out of her mind. Is there drug use going on at this present time? Who are you talking to? To you, Whitney. Ask me no questions like I'm a child. Y'all want to know what I'm doing all the time. I don't give a shit about what you're doing all the time. You are so nosy, man. You don't even know what I do. Like you said, you never met me. You don't know me. You ain't been in my house. You don't live with me. You don't sleep with me. You don't do shit with me, but talk about me. So watch what you say. Watch what the you say. And if I was really like back in the day in North, I'd meet you outside. I'd meet you outside. But I'm a lady and I have a class. I wasn't shocked by it because I was trapped in the web of cocaine for many, many years. So, you know, like they say, surgery knows surgery. Addiction knows addiction. Do you see what I'm saying? Tellingly, Whitney had found it impossible to publicly confront the extent of her problem, even in her most open and confessional moments. Do you think of yourself as an addict? I don't like to think of myself addicted. I like to think of I had a bad habit. Which can be broken 